So if we are very rare, we did win the, the cosmic lottery. So we're a lucky planet. We're just in a very fortunate place. When you consider chance as an explanation for a planet like Earth, you have to look at it in the context of the universe as a whole. While the odds appear astonishingly small that you'd get all the right ingredients to support complex life at this one place in the galaxy, you have to keep in mind that our galaxy is just one of perhaps 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. Still, logically, I think you have to ask yourself, what if this convergence of factors didn't come about as the result of simply a cosmic lottery or a mere fluke or luck, but what if it's the result of some larger underlying purpose or design? And if the Earth does exist for a purpose, is there any way that we could tell? On October the 24th, 1995, a rare natural phenomenon unexpectedly triggered a unique search for an answer. Oh, look at this guy. It started with an experience I had in 1995. I went to observe a total eclipse of the sun in India. It was my first and still only total eclipse of the sun. It was a spectacular event. It's just an experience for all the emotions. Either astronomers who can understand the whole phenomenon can predict it to within a second of time anywhere on the Earth, or a local native are equally in awe and reacting in the same way to this incredible phenomenon. It really left a big impression on me. For 51 unforgettable seconds, Guillermo Gonzalez and thousands of others looked on in wonder at this rare astronomical event. Gonzalez would later reflect upon both the mysterious beauty he had witnessed in the North Indian skies and the factors that had made it possible. Fabulous. Fabulous. The requirements for producing a total eclipse of the sun are a luminous body, in our case the sun, an eclipsing body, in our case the moon, and then an observer platform, in our case the surface of the Earth. And they all have to be in a straight line in space. The apparent size of the moon in the sky has to be almost exactly the same as the apparent size of the sun in the sky. They're both about half a degree. The sun is 400 times bigger than the moon, but it's 400 times further away. So there's this coincidence people have noted for centuries, but they just said, oh, well, it's a coincidence, and shrug their shoulders. As Gonzalez examined this rare alignment of sun, moon, and earth, he recognized the importance of these celestial bodies to the existence of complex life on our planet. The gravitational pull exerted by our moon, for example, is strong enough to regulate the Earth's climate by stabilizing its tilt and helping to circulate the warm and cold waters of its oceans. While our planet's distance from the sun permits both liquid water and an oxygen-rich atmosphere. You have to have the right distance of the observer's home planet from its host star, and you have to have a large moon, and so there's this very strong overlap between the requirements for producing eclipses and the requirements for habitability, for having a planet that can support life. In 1999, Gonzalez described this relationship between our survival and our ability to observe solar eclipses in the journal Astronomy and Geophysics. His ideas intrigued philosopher Jay Richards. I've been focusing my research in cosmology and in particular on applying probability theory to the fine-tuning of the laws of physics. I had a strong sense that this evidence pointed towards some sort of wider purpose to the universe. Then I read Gonzalez's work and I had the same feeling that he did, that perfect solar eclipses were sort of the tip of the iceberg, the first instance of an entire class of evidence that provides a way uh, for judging if the universe is the result of a fluke or some impersonal process or the result of purpose or design. In the summer of 1999, Gonzalez and Richards initiated a program of joint research. They began their study by considering a characteristic of solar eclipses little known outside the scientific community. These striking events are not only compelling to observe, they also open a portal onto the physics and chemistry of the entire universe.
really you can think of eclipses as a giant natural experiment uh, set up that allows us to observe a part of the sun that's critical towards understanding how its light is produced in its atmosphere. The fact that the Earth is going around the sun and the moon is around the Earth and the sizes and the distances between the Earth and the moon and the sun are just so to give you a perfect solar eclipse is a wondrous thing because it allows us to measure the constituents of the upper layers of the sun's atmosphere. During a solar eclipse, the moon fits so perfectly over the sun that it shields its blinding light, providing astronomers with a view of the star's atmosphere, otherwise impossible to experience. At the moment of totality, the pinkish arc of the chromosphere, the atmosphere's innermost layer becomes visible and with it a rainbow-like band called the flash spectrum appears when the sun is viewed through a prism. The eclipse of 1870 led to an understanding of the structure of the sun's chromosphere and the discovery of helium, the second most abundant element in the universe. The spectrum is probably the single greatest source of information about a star. And it was during a couple of historic eclipses in the 19th century that astronomers figure out how the spectrum of the sun is produced. And they only were able to figure it out because of the particular circumstances during a total eclipse. These circumstances are both precise and crucial. If our moon was slightly larger, it would partially block our view of the chromosphere and diminish its spectral light. A smaller moon would allow too much light from the sun, destroying our view of the solar atmosphere and the flash spectrum. And so you have to have a nearly perfect match between the sun and the moon, so you don't hide the chromosphere. And that insight afforded by eclipses in the 19th century is what finally permitted astronomers to figure out how the spectra of distant stars are produced. Really, that opened up stellar astrophysics and allowed us to understand how other stars work because distant stars, after all, are other suns. The relationship between eclipses and scientific discovery was also revealed in the spring of 1919. On May the 29th, research teams headed by British astronomer Arthur Eddington photographed the sun and adjacent stars in the Hyades star cluster during the darkness of totality. Later analysis of the pictures verified that the sun's gravity bent light from distant stars traveling toward the Earth at the angle Albert Einstein had predicted. Einstein's theory of relativity, an idea that revolutionized our understanding of the universe, had been confirmed during a total solar eclipse. And that experiment was only possible because the stars become visible during a total eclipse. They are very important in the history of science. and. The best place in the entire solar system to view solar eclipses is from the surface of the Earth. I've actually calculated the circumstances for eclipses from all the other planets and all the other moons, about 65 of them, the, the major moons. And it's an amazing coincidence. The one place that has observers is the one place that has the best eclipses. Within 